Good morning and welcome to M4C, Minakasha Community Christian Church Online. I'm Pastor Andy Morris and we welcome you to something that's new for all of us. Our world has changed a bit in the last few days and every day we see more and more evidence that all of us need to do our part to provide for the safety of our church, for our family, our friends, and to honor the requests of our president and national leaders and our state leaders to take care of our communities that we live in. Friends, today, churches all across the country have left the building. As crazy as this week has been, I'd like to give us and take some time to take some perspective. This is an adventure, not one we'd normally chose to experience, but it's our reality. And I wanna challenge us all to remember that historically God's church has faced challenges, obstacles, and often resistance. And in the face of all of those, the church has thrived. I've watched exactly that take place this past week among our church family as well as other churches and in the lives of brothers and sisters all over the world as they prepare to shift to adapt and adjust their services and their ministries in light of the current limitations and concerns about our health. Thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for letting us spend some time with you and your family in your home today. And as I've said from the very beginning of this adventure, God's not surprised by any of this. And I'm pretty certain that our Heavenly Father can still hear us from our homes or wherever we might be tuning into this broadcast as we raise our voices together in praise, as we consider our service and ministry to Him, and as we study His Word together in unity, in spirit and in truth. Would you join with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that even though we can't be together physically, we are together emotionally and spiritually. Father, we are joining hands together figuratively to lift our voices, our hearts, our prayers, our concerns for our neighbors, for our friends, for our families, for people all around the world. Father, this is not about us. This is about all of us. And so, Father, help us to be good neighbors. Help us to be a light that shines bright through this difficult time. And Lord, we pray at the end of the day and at the end of this crisis, you are going to be glorified. The people are going to see the hope and the peace that we have through you and your son, Jesus Christ. We commit this time to you. We commit ourselves to you. And we know that you love us no matter what, no matter where. You've got this. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, we want to welcome a few of our praise team from here at M4C. And they're going to lead us in a couple of songs whose messages are very timely. They remind us of the hope, the peace as well as our total dependence on the one who came to save us all. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find.
come to the point of our service where normally we pass baskets around for people to give the gifts that they feel compelled by the Lord to give to the ministry of the church. But unfortunately, this is not the normal service. So we are actually offering, if you are still wanting to give a gift or feel compelled to give a gift, we have the address for the church that you can uh, send your gifts to, or you can also drop it by the church and we'll get it where it needs to be. Um, this is kind of a weird time for us right now. This is something new for a lot of churches, but thankfully it's not new to God and it's not new to the experience of the church as a whole in history. Actually, in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul expresses this. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us also. I think that's a very important scripture for us to understand during this time where everyone seems to be in crisis is that even this church, Paul gives as an example, that even at their worst times, he says that they were in poverty, but they still had joy. And from that joy, they were still generous. He said that they gave from what they could, but also sometimes even exceeded that point because they gave themselves to the Lord first. And I think in this time, even though it seems crazy, what's awesome is that the church can still be that light and that hope in this time where everyone seems to be freaking out, where the church can be this beacon of generosity, this beacon of joy in a time where everyone is worried about what's going to happen in the next day. So my challenge to us is as we give what we feel compelled to give, we also look for more ways that we can be the church, that we can give from what we have, but also exceed that as what Paul said there. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you modeled generosity for us first. Not only did you give us every good thing that we have, but you gave us your son, which is the most important thing, that we have this great salvation, this great joy. And I pray you help us have a spirit of generosity to give out of the overflow of what you've given us. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.
Folks, I apologize last week as we were preparing and thinking that eh, we're going to probably have to go online this week and, and go video, and, and I really apologize. I know that normally just the audio is a little easier to deal with than having to look at this, but I promise you, I'm not real excited about looking at the camera that's staring me in the fast either. So, hey, it's been quite a week. I want to take a moment to let you know how grateful I am for the entire M4C Church family. You have been so encouraging, so supportive this past week, checking on each other, helping out your church family, as well as your neighbors, your friends, and your family, and especially our leadership team. The elders, Jacob and myself, have been spending from 30 minutes to an hour every evening this past week on conference calls, discussing daily updates and new information on this coronavirus crisis as well as the concerns of our church family and determining the best steps forward for us as a church during this challenging time. And most importantly, we've been praying. We've been praying for you, we've been praying for our community, for our global, national, and statewide leaders, and for everyone impacted in so many ways. It's been obvious that you've been praying for us as well. I shared with my wife on Wednesday, I can just sense the prayers and we are so grateful. We realize that it's been the strength and the love and most importantly your prayers that have helped us and our m 4 team face the challenges to be with you digitally right now. So just for a few moments I'd like us to do something that we always do. I want us to stop thinking about the COVID virus and I want us to take a look at the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. If you have your Bible handy please open to that chapter so you can follow along. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time today, let me explain that in January, our church started looking at Jesus with eyes wide open, examining different experiences and encounters in the life of Christ as he ministered through the last three years of his life. And if you'd like to listen to any of those messages, they can be found under the sermon tab on the M4C homepage under 2020 Vision Messages. Now, gratefully for you, they're only in audio, okay? The past several weeks we've been looking at Jesus as he calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And that might not seem like that big of a deal, but understand the Sea of Galilee was about 13 miles long and at its widest point, seven miles wide. It's below sea level and it's surrounded by foothills with valleys where the wind can whip through and create what seemed like instant storms. Kind of like the last couple weeks here in our country and in our world. And it can catch those who find themselves sailing on the lake at the wrong time, fearing for their life. And that was what the disciples of Jesus, many that grew up on that same lake in their family fishing business, found themselves in. That night we talked about a few weeks ago, the wind and the waves were so bad that these experienced fishermen, these experienced sailors, they thought they were going to drown. So in their fear, they looked and there's Jesus sleeping in the bow of the boat but not for long. They woke him up and then he spoke. First he called them out. He's like, oh, you little faith. But then he spoke, peace be still. The winds died down. The waves grew calm and the disciples, they were looking at Jesus with eyes open wide. Who is this man? A short time later, we read that there was a large crowd that had followed to listen to Jesus. And it was getting later in the day and the people were hungry. So Jesus took care of it. With just a few barley loaves and a few small fish that was found in the entire crowd, Jesus blessed this food and they started to pass it around and around and around. And they fed thousands, literally over 5,000 men, along with their wives and children. 
And friends, after everyone had eaten their fill, there were 12 baskets of food that were left over. The past couple weeks, we've been looking at the sixth chapter of John's record of Jesus' life, specifically his encounters with these large crowds that he miraculously fed on the hillside. They were so excited about the miracle and the miracle worker that they wanted to proclaim him their king, their Messiah, and to follow him as he overthrew the Judean and the Roman authorities. Jesus did his best to help them understand that they were missing the point. He didn't come to this earth to set up a kingdom on earth, but they just didn't get it. And when he tried to correct them the first time, they asked him, how do we do the works of God? And his response, it was really simple. He said, believe in the one he has sent. Now, he was talking about himself, but again, they missed the point. Last week, we picked up in verse 30, and the people were asking Jesus for a sign, reminding Jesus that Moses, when he was leading the people of God through the wilderness after they'd left Egypt, God had provided manna, a bread-like food that provided for their daily hunger, daily. Then Jesus declared this. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Like many still today, the people wanted what they wanted when they wanted. In other words, they were still missing the point. Jesus had just taken a small boy's lunch, fed over 10,000 people. <laughs> and you want a sign? <laughs> Again, Jesus tries to explain, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. We see that in John 6, 38. Has anybody ever heard of or experienced conflict and bad behavior between family members when a loved one dies? Unfortunately, people can behave so badly at times like that, and though a person can anticipate and try to direct the disposal of their earthly goods, because of their children and their family's self-interest, their best wishes, even their will sometimes, can be disrupted, challenged, and even overturned. Not often it's, is it completely overturned, but sometimes what ultimately happens is nothing like what they had wished and wanted for their family. And the worst part is this, relationships between the family members are never even close to the same. Friends, that's what Jesus is referring to here. The Father's will, God's plan for his children, his desire is that everyone would look to, believe in, and be saved by Jesus. They would be risen to new life, eternal life, in the person and by the sacrifice of Jesus. God's desire is for all of us to eat this bread of life, the bread that once you taste, you'll never be hungry again. Believe in the one the Father sent, Jesus, the bread of life, and friends, you will live. That's God's will. And he wrote it down, and Jesus reminded us all so that God's wishes, God's will, would be followed. But the truth is not everyone chooses to honor or respect God's wishes, even though they read it for themselves. And, and our Father doesn't force himself on anyone. About this time in the text of John 6, verse 41, it reads, At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread of life that come down from heaven. The rest of John 6 is more of the give and take between Jesus and these folks who didn't like the terms of their Father's will. And finally, in verse 43, Jesus says, Stop grumbling among yourselves. <laughs> they weren't pleased. They didn't like Jesus' words. And then Jesus continues on to tell them in verse 46, No one has seen the Father except the one who's from God. Only he has seen the Father. He's talking about himself. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Friends, I want you to hold on to that for a moment, and we're going to look at that again, verse 47, in just a, a minute. But from this point in the conversation with Jesus and the crowd of followers, it really goes in the wrong direction. The more they talked, the more Jesus corrected them, and they really didn't like what he was saying. So why would we be surprised? All throughout the Old Testament, we see the people of God lacking trust and turning from God to trusting their own desires, their own wisdom, and whatever was convenient or easy for them, kind of like the God of the month club. God continued to reach out to them, 
provide for them, rescue them time and time again with his mercy and his grace, and yet he allowed them to choose whether or not they would accept or reject his lordship in their life. And Jesus is reminding these folks in John chapter 6, they were making a similar choice right now. And indirectly, Jesus is reminding you and me in March of 2020, in the midst of one of the most crazy, confusing, chaotic, chaotic, tang tangled moment, chaotic times most of us can remember. We have a choice to make. When it comes to believing and accepting our Father's will, we can either accept Jesus for who he is, or we can say, not going there. Friends, don't miss that point. As we look at John chapter 6, we see more back and forth between the people and Jesus. And we come to verse 60, where we see a defining moment in the lives of many who would follow Jesus. At least when it was good for them. But notice what happens when Jesus wouldn't give them what they wanted when they wanted. We read their, rever their response in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Friends, the word of God often is hard. The truth of God is so simple, and yet it's so complex, and it is never easy. If somebody says it is, they're either completely ignorant, and I don't mean that in a sarcastic or judgmental way, but they simply don't understand, and they've missed the point. Or, they're not being honest about their thoughts, their question, and their occasional doubts that all of us have. And the reality is, when it comes down to making a decision, they don't want to give up control of their life to surrender to and believe in Christ as Lord of theirs. The Spirit gives life, Jesus says in verse 63. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. As we look at this passage, there seem to be three groups that we can identify here in this text. There's the 12, the original men that were called by Jesus himself to come follow him. There's no question who they are and the role they played in his life and his ministry. There's another group that we see, and that's the larger group of people, the group that he fed on the hillside the day before, the ones who'd gotten excited about Jesus and the miracles he performed, and they were hoping he'd lead them in rebellion and to ultimate victory against Rome. The third group we see Jesus encountering over and over again in this text, as well as several other the instances that are recorded in the four records of Jesus' life and ministry, what we call the Gospels, are the vocal troublemakers. John referred to them early simply as the Jews, predominantly the leaders of the Jewish faith. Jesus, in his profound wisdom, he forces those who were on the fence, who were not ready to commit to him, but they were sure interested and curious. Jesus forces them to choose sides. Do you believe in me, he said? Will you taste and live and never be hungry again? While to many those seem like easy questions, they demand a decision and they demand an answer. Verse 66 brings into focus what he really was thinking as many of these followers and what was in their heart and mind. In verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Friends, we need to catch this because this verse is so clear and yet it's really easy to miss what J John is stating in that text. This was a defining moment. It was right now, it was this sermon where the masses, the crowds of the curious started to shift from Jesus and walk away. And Jesus knew it. Think about it. He is God in the flesh. He knew their hearts. He knew what they were going to do. I, I read one Scott Bible scholar who, who called this encounter in John 6, the worst sermon that was never preached. He said, Jesus started out with thousands and he ended up with a handful. And he knew this was gonna happen and yet he stayed true to what he had to do. Friends, though he was God, in verse 67, we see the humanity of Christ. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12, his closest followers, the ones who'd been with, been with him day and night for two and a half years. Jesus is tired, he's exhausted, 
physically, emotionally, spiritually. He's been going without rest for days now, and he's consciously making a choice right here that he knows is going to get him killed. But he does it anyway, and friends, he does it because of love. He knows it's the only way that you and I could eat the bread, could drink the, the water, and never thirst, and never be hungry again. But in his exhaustion, and in his hurt and disappointment, as he watches these, he came to save, rejecting him and walking away. It just seems natural he turned to those who'd been sharing life with him intimately for two years and said, what about you? Do you want to leave too? The last four or five sermons that I have shared with you have been building to these two short verses that are recorded in the 68th and 69th verse of John's sixth chapter. It's Peter's answer to Jesus with this question. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know you are the Holy One of God. Friends, Peter didn't understand that day how profound his words really are. But you can agree with me, they are. He doesn't deny the words of Jesus are difficult or that he and the rest, they don't begin to understand what he's talking about. But Peter doesn't hesitate to speak his heart. And I pray that our belief, our convictions, will rise to the surface just as readily when we're faced with that question. Will you leave me also? May our response be, where else could we go? To whom? Could we go? You alone, Jesus. We know you are the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. And friends, if you haven't heard anything else from me in the past few months, as we've looked at and examined the life of Jesus, please, please hear these words from the mouth of Simon Peter. Where else would we go? You alone have the words of life. You are the Holy One of God. Now, I asked you earlier, to hold on for a moment to verse 47. Let's look at that now. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Friends, we live in a world much different than it was just a few weeks ago. And much like these same followers of Jesus who stayed loyal and faithful, even when they saw thousands who were walking away, we have a choice to make. I asked the question a few weeks ago, when your boat seems to be taking in water, when the storm is threatening to overwhelm you, who do you want beside you in your boat? I told you, I want the one who can speak the words, peace be still. I told you, I want the one who can walk on water, who can heal the sick, who can make the lame to walk and can open the eyes of the blind, including me. And I pray you do as well. Friends, may we truly look at Jesus with eyes wide open. Because when we do, though the storms may continue to rage all around us, we know who is in the boat with us. I'm going to do something now that's a little intimidating. I'm going to sing a cappella, which I often do, but usually not to be recorded and on the internet forever to come back and haunt me. But... There was a song that was recorded back in 1986 by a, a young Christian artist by the name of Steve Camp. And it's one of those songs that has stayed with me over the years. And the simple melody and the words are ingrained into my mind. And I pray that I never lose them. And I pray we'll be, they'll be as helpful to you as they have been to me through the years and in the coming weeks. When you're alone and your heart is torn he is all you need when you're confused your soul is bruised he is all you need he's the rock of your soul he's the anchor that holds through your desperate times when your way is unsure his love will endure and peace you will find through all your years the joy the tears 
He is all you need. When you give in to that familiar sin, He is all you need. Guilt has you paralyzed, it slowly eats you alive. He is all you need. He'll be faithful to you, though your heart is untrue and your love's grown cold. His forgiveness is real, it'll comfort and heal your sin-weary soul. God loves you so, he'll never let you go. He is all you need. Through all the years, the joy, the tears, He is all you need. Would you pray with me? Father, help us today and every day remember you're all we need. Lord, help, our, help us keep our eyes wide open, focused on you, so nothing that this world brings will distract us from your eternal purposes for us and for your church. Lord, thank you for being the bread of life. Thank you for being the water of life. Thank you, Father, for coming to us so that one day we can come to you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are now coming to what I think is one of the most important parts in our service. I love music. I think it's very important to hear the word of God spoken. I enjoy the concept of giving back to God a portion of what is his. But communion for me is what church service and worship is all about. And I wanna look at it this morning, looking at Psalms 121. We've had an interesting change of events over the last several weeks to months one that I don't think any of us ever dreamed of or foresaw, but here we are. And all it does is remind me that life is a journey. I think prior generations would say about the same thing as what we're looking at now. We can go back to December 7th, 1941 with Pearl Harbor. We can look at Vietnam and some of the atrocious deaths that were experienced during that war of Americans. We can look back to 9-11. We can even go even to the Gulf War if you want. And then we're getting to the point where a lot of people that will be watching this video and participating in the service with us have no clue what we're talking about because they've never experienced it. Well, God knew this was coming and he wrote about it in the Bible. And that's where I wanna look at Psalm 121 and read it this morning and relate that to what we're thinking about when we partake of communion. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is all new to us. It's not new to God. He knew that life was gonna be a journey for us as we go along for each and every soul that is present on this earth. What do we do with it? We can get bogged down in the facts of life, the trauma, the trials, the tribulation, the horribleness of it, being scared. But should we be worried about where we're going and or what is or who is gonna take care of us? Uh, no, we shouldn't, because God is always there. He knew what we were looking at. He knew what we would face. And we celebrate that as we come to communion. Jesus came to the cross to forgive us of our sins and to create and finish a covenant with his people, those that accept him as Lord and Savior. As we partake of the loaf and cup, we look at the fact that Jesus gave up his life in place of mine and in place of yours. When he shed his blood, he shed his blood to provide the, the um, covering that we needed so that when we get to, as Revelation speaks of, robes of white, 
we can wear them, not because of what we did, not because of what we will ever do, but because of God's love for us. And as we partake of communion this morning, we need to remember that this is a journey. We are never promised roses without thorns. We know that we're gonna have problems. It's just part of life. But we also know that we have someone that is caring for us each and every time and watching over us. We can look to the hills, we can look to our government, but we need to look to God because he is the one that's gonna protect us and he is the one that will get us back into a relationship with him. And at one day when our time here is done, we can live with him forever in heaven. I invite the people that are here, just as we invite you at home to partake of communion with us. The loaf and the cup, as we're told in 1 Corinthians, when Jesus spoke, he used these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, mine just malfunctioned. <laughs> Go ahead and you can eat the bread. In the same manner, after supper he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we also look forward to that time when he's coming back again and we get to live with him forever. Shall we pray? I thank you that, Father, that your love carries us that we can look at the fact that when we are down, you are still there with us. When we are afraid, you are still there guiding and direct us. As we go through this time in our lives, in this journey, that you knew we would be undertaking, we didn't, but you did. We thank you that you are there walking beside us, that you are there to carry us when, you need, when we need you to carry us. We thank you that we have the promise that no matter what happens on this earth, we can still look at the planet, we can see the beauty of it, we can see the creativity that you use to create it, and we can look at you as our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, and the conqueror. We know that we have everlasting life because of you, not because of us, and we look forward to that time as we go through this time until we get to be with you again in heaven. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Friends, again, I want to thank you for joining us today in our M4C family. Please keep watching for the remind notes that will be sent out, email communications, as well as watching our Facebook page and the church website. On our M4C website, we've added a new button on the top of the page called Info. Under that, you will find all of the updated notes and letters that we are sending out to the church family, as well as a resource folder that contains prayer guides, family devotionals, encouraging ideas of how to continue to be in community during this time that we are being very extreme and cautious. Under the sermon page, there's a new folder where we're placing the study questions for each week's message. So take a time to look at that and even share it together with your friends. Remember, social distancing does not mean social isolation. So reach out and touch someone, just not physically. Help us spread the words to friends and family by sharing the posts from our church page, our online service, as well as encouraging others. If you're, if you're comfortable, invite a few of your neighbors or church family members that live nearby. Join together in your home and watch, participate in the service together until we're able to join together as one large family here at 720 J Street. Please keep in touch. And if you have a special need or just need to talk and pray, Please call me, contact me, text me, or one of our other church leaders. Though our face-to-face -face time might be limited right now, 
I believe we can be just as if not more connected during this challenging time than we could have imagined possible. Remember, as we talked earlier today, as Jesus told the believers in John 6, 47, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. Friends, if you have questions or would like to know more about the truth of Christ's love and the amazing gift that he's given us of eternal life, please contact me and I'd love to visit and share with you how you too can know his truth and truly live with the one who can calm any and every storm at your side and in your lifeboat. Thank you all. Watch for us next Sunday as we consider and learn about the source of peace. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 7 verses 36 to 50 with eyes wide open. God bless you all and I look forward to talking to you soon.